Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Somehow, in a year when we've seen the debut of a mid-engine Corvette and an electric Mustang, it's Tesla that manages to unveil the most controversial vehicle of the year, if not the decade, if not ever. I'm obviously talking about the Tesla Cybertruck, which debuted last week in a circus-like unveiling with sledgehammers, broken glass, bullets, and an ATV. The dust has since settled, but the controversy over the truck's design, how it was unveiled, and whether or not Elon Musk is certifiably insane continues. On this week's episode, senior editor Jeff Perez and I square off on the Tesla Cybertruck. Jeff, welcome to the show. Now, let's set the stage a little. Um, I have, This is my third editor head-to-head battle. Um, and it's also, of all, you know, the first two we've done were also about electric vehicles as well. The first one was me versus uh, managing editor Brandon Turkis, where he argued for the Porsche Taycan, and I argued for the Tesla Model S. The second one was just last week, uh, where Chris Smith argued against the Mustang Mach-E, or really just the Mustang name, and I argued for it. And now here we are, once again, uh, I'm on the pro side uh, of the EV equation, arguing for the Tesla Cybertruck. What side are you taking? I am taking the anti-Cybertruck take. I guess not really the Cybertruck as a concept, but the way everything just went off the other night with it. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction, actually, because and, and I think it's one people are struggling with, because obviously the truck's design is so polarizing, like everyone is going to have a reaction to that. And I think that's OK, because I we, we say all the time in our car reviews that um, design is subjective, beauty is subjective, but distinct from from just reacting to the design there was the whole spectacle of the unveiling there are the pre-orders there's the you know what's next like can this thing even reach production there are so many questions left unanswered honestly this is the first head-to-head battle where i i don't feel like i'm on solid ground (laughs) so (laughs) i'm gonna try my hardest uh but i feel kind of like anakin looking up at obi-wan and him telling me not to try it because he's got the higher ground (laughs) Uh, I'm going to try it anyway, Uh, but you you may slash my legs off with a lightsaber uh, during this conversation. Um, All right. Before we begin, let's tell everyone some facts about the Cybertruck, just so everyone knows what we're talking about. Uh, This is Tesla's electric pickup truck. Uh, You can call it a concept. You can call it a prototype. You can it's probably more accurately just their vision of of a truck. Um, it, it has a crazy design with zero curves and only flat planes, edges, and points. Uh, and that's because it's made out of super hard steel uh, that forms an, a structural exoskeleton. And the steel is so hard that it can't be stamped into complex shapes. So it can only be folded and used in these kind of flat, um, flat planes or sheets. Um, it supposedly has armor level glass, although we'll talk about uh, the <laughs> failed demonstration that happened during the unveiling. Uh, there's a very simple Spartan interior with a big screen and a Tesla Roadster like steering wheel that's not actually a wheel. Um, uh, as for the specs, there's going to be three models a single motor rear wheel drive, dual motor all wheel drive, and tri motor all-wheel drive Um, and the best specs are for the tri-motor version that one will have 500 miles of range uh, 14,000 pound towing capacity 3,500 pound payload and a 0 to 60 time of 2.9 seconds Um, I think the most shocking spec that they released is the pricing Uh, this uh, will supposedly have a base price of $39,900 $39,900 for the base model, the single motor rear wheel drive, $49,900 for the middle trim, the dual mo- motor all wheel drive, and $69,900 for the tri motor all wheel drive. And I think that's, I mean, uh, the, the $40,000 base price is amazing, but I also think the, the $70,000 um, uh, price for the tri motor is pretty amazing too because you know, a a major competitor of this truck will be the Rivian. Uh, I think it's the R1T. And the base price of that truck is 69,000. So it's extremely competitive pricing. Uh, 
and production will start late 2021 for the first two trims and late 2022 for the tri-motor. So those are the, those are the basic um, specs. And I, I think it's fair for anyone to question those since this is, isn't uh, in production yet. And of course, anything could change. The specs could change, the pricing could change. Um, but this is the, the target they released um, for all of these things. So let me ask you, let me start here because I think this helps my case. Take the design away. Just think about everything I just said about the specs and how does how do those numbers hit you? Um, God, a lot of them just feel so unrealistic to me. So 39.9 to start sounds like awesome, theoretically. But just thinking about all the production and all the like, especially just the body, especially, how do you think they're going to get to that price? Well, I think there's a, uh, there's two things I think they've done that may help lower the cost of production. Um, for one thing, th they said they're using the same metal they're using that SpaceX, Elon's other company, is using for their Starship, uh, which is their rocket to go to Mars. So it sounds like they're sharing costs with SpaceX to both develop the metal and then produce and use it. So maybe that's one cost savings. Mm -hmm. Another one is the metal Elon said is so strong that it can't be stamped by a traditional press, which is what automakers usually use to make body panels. Um, and I actually asked someone in the stamping yeah. business, is, is there such a thing as metal like that? And they said, yeah, you can, you can formulate an alloy of, of stainless steel that is so hard that it can't be pressed by traditional methods. There are other problems that that arise because you've increased the hardness so much, but you know it, it's absolutely possible they they could be using a metal that that can't be formed into complex shapes like that. So that could decrease production costs too because you're not using a huge stamping press, which is traditionally an expensive part of production. Um, and then another thing, which I think is clever in a couple ways, is that it's just bare stainless steel, so they're not painting it, mm -hmm. and. A, that saves costs from not having a painting booth and going through all of that. Uh, but Tesla has proven it's not very good at painting cars. So it right. kind of, they side skirt that whole problem by just putting it out there in, in pure stainless steel. And if you want to do something with the color, like wrap it, you can do that yourself. So I, when I see the base price of 39.9, it, it does seem, I agree, it seems super aggressive. Mm. However, I also see a couple innovations here where I think they are definitely trying to reduce costs in places that I think other manufacturers haven't tried. Um, now, whether or not they successfully make the $39,900 one is a good question. You know, they promised a $35,000 Model 3. They made it for like six months, but then they stopped selling it right. because nobody wanted it. Yeah. So, so in theory, like, the truck would be as expensive as a Model 3. The yeah. Base. The base yeah. version of the truck. I mean, I mean the the seven the base the base version, yeah, would like be about the same price as a Model Three. That's crazy. I agree. That's completely crazy it to is. think to, to think about. Um, so yeah, I I don't know whether or not to believe that either. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, I, I f I'm optimistic. I, I'd like to think that this thing will cost thirty nine thousand dollars because I mean, look. I, I want electric trucks. I like electric cars. I don't have an issue with the EV side of things. It's just that Tesla does a lot of over-promising and under-delivering, and that's pretty obvious when you said that with the Model 3, the pricing, which, you know, they did introduce a $35,000 Model 3, but it turned it out to be, you know, closer to a $40,000 Model 3. Um, so that's, another, that's, that's just part of my skepticism with this overall, you know, introduction, saying it's going to be that affordable. Well, but... I, the only reason I disagree with how you frame that is because they they brought out the thirty five thousand dollar Model Three last after they had already been selling the the fifty sixty thousand dollar Model Threes, mm -hmm. and when they introduced it, obviously the thirty five thousand dollar version has the lowest range and the least amount of features, and it just turns out that the people buying Model Threes didn't want to buy a bare bones Model Three they wanted to buy more expensive ones. So that's why, uh, to me, that's that's how I frame it in my head, is like, well, they they gave us what 
they promised, but they had already hooked us on the more expensive ones. So just nobody wanted to to buy the $35,000 ones. I, I think that will actually be true of the Cybertruck, too. I think people are mostly going to buy the the middle trim that that has a 300 mile range mm-hmm. and the tri motor that has a 500 mile range i think few people are going to buy the base model that has around a 250 mile range and the weakest towing and all of that right um and is only real wheel drive that's the only trim that's rear wheel drive mm-hmm. uh versus all wheel drive for the others so um but i agree like if they hit those price targets that would be incredible so it's it's very hard to believe that they're going to be able to um that that those prices aren't going to creep up so um so i'll 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 give that to you but i don't think either of us really win that point because it's so early we just have no idea you know two years from now when this comes out you know who knows what price it's going to be or what's going to happen between now and then what about um what about the specs in terms of um particularly like the the maximum 500 mile range like that's to me that is that leapfrogs i mean we have yeah. we don't even have a production car that's 400 miles yet. yeah that that's another one of those numbers that feels just totally unrealistic especially for a, a truck that's this big um like you said we don't even have a, a model 3 or model s that 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 has that much range yet so it's ambitious to say the least that they want uh, a cyber truck with that uh, range, but uh, like, how, how are they going to do this? I would say if you look at the other trucks, like the Rivian truck and some of the others, they're all promising like 400 mile ranges as well. Mm -hmm. I I think it has something to do with the fact that trucks are larger vehicles so you can fit more batteries. I think the, 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 all the vehicles we've been talking about, like the, the test, the Tesla cars, the Porsche Taycan, the Mustang Mach-E even, those are all a lot smaller platforms and you can only fit so many batteries in their like skateboard chassis. Right. But you also have to factor truck is so much bigger. You also have to factor in things like weight and, you know, cabin space. You can't just shove as many batteries as you want into a vehicle and say, all right, it has 600 miles of range, but you know, no cabin space and it weighs 10,000 pounds. Yeah. But when your batteries are underneath the vehicle, it's, and, and you've got so much vehicle square footage to work with in Mm -hmm. a truck, you know, I I, honestly, I don't think Tesla is that far off here because I Rivian has already claimed 400 miles for theirs and, you know, they're still vaporware, but you know, they claimed it and everyone just shook their head and said, okay, um, uh, Bollinger is promising big numbers. You know, the, the manufacturers like Ford and, and GM who have also, announced that they will be uh, selling electric pickups in the next two to three years. They have not talked about range. And I think that's more interesting because all the startups like Bollinger, Rivian and Tesla, they they have no problem throwing out numbers two years in advance. But the automakers who are just, you know, much more traditional and conservative, Mm -hmm. I I think they're not going to throw out a number until they're sure they can hit it right and they don't they they're very they're much more wary of over promising and under delivering so. yeah and i think that makes sense to an extent right because tesla like i said has a, has a bit of a history of over promising and under delivering and that's sort of that's not necessarily their fault um i mean i guess it is but if you if you come out and say our truck has 500 miles, right? That's super exciting. Like people see that number and they're excited. They want to put down more pre-orders. But then if you come to market and you say, well, we actually only got 450 miles or 400 miles, that's kind of disappointing, no? I would say it's disappointing, and but is it? I, I've heard people throw around the word fraudulent or even maybe a softer. It's misleading. Um, yeah, yeah, I could see that. I mean, even. I mean, this is we're going to talk more about this, but the, just the the fact that you're asking people to put down a deposit on a vehicle that doesn't really exist is is borderline fraudulent. That's really strong. I I, I mean, especially because I mean, Ford asked people to put down a five hundred dollar deposit on the Mustang Mach E, and that's not coming out until you know later next year, or you know if it's delayed even longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and but they the were Ma- asking five hundred dollars. But the Mach E is is production ready, like it's ready to go. There, there's obviously some things wrong with the with the Cybertruck still. That's true. But see, I, I'm just listening to the words you're using. You're using, and you're using like there's something wrong with it. And I see it as it's in development. You know, like right. like I assume they're going to answer the questions about 
is the design legal? Like, what about rear view mirrors, which it has none? What about a windshield wiper, which it has none? You know, all those questions that we have about can this truck even pass federal regulations for vehicles the way it's designed? Mm -hmm. I assume there are answers for those. I just, I have to assume that Elon Musk and and I don't mean to put it all on him. He's just a figurehead. But I assume I have to assume that the people at Tesla are smart enough to have thought of those things and have some idea of how they will address them. Because if they haven't and they've debuted this truck and taken these pre-orders, but they know that they're going to have to wildly change the truck in order to have it meet regulations, then I would agree with you. I, I do think that's misleading. Although I think the saving grace is really that they're asking for for pre-orders asking for one hundred dollars and it's completely refundable so they're not taking money and 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 not giving you know not giving the ability to have it refunded it's a very kind of low barrier to entry for a pre-order you know like i said the mach is is five hundred dollars mm-hmm. um which and let me uh let me be honest and out there i actually did put down the pre-order for the cyber truck uh, and it was more out of curiosity and because it was it's no commitment and uh, to me a hundred dollars wasn't that much and i and plus it's you know this is our job and i thought you know somebody one of us should should be in line just to see what happens to people who who are in line and i i I had no hesitation doing it for the cyber truck i was going to do it for the mach e but i'm like man five hundred dollars that's a lot to tie up in something that i don't even know if i want to buy and and so it's two two very complete two completely different strategies by Ford and Tesla because I think for anyone who put down five hundred dollars on a Mach E probably has a lot higher intention of buying one than someone put who put down a hundred dollars right. on a on a Cybertruck. But do, but how many people do you think will recoup that hundred dollars, or do you think they'll just say ah eh, whatever, or they'll forget about it? I Man, I, I know I won't. I but but I'm people call me cheap and 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 <laughs> you know I know where every cent of mine is at all times. So I don't think I'm gonna I'm gonna let them keep it. Um, because part of me thinks that that hundred dollars is just like the perfect number, right? Because you have these people that are just all in on Tesla, especially like really wealthy you know young people, and they say. You know, oh, it's a hundred dollars. Even if I don't want the truck, they can still have my money because you know I like what Tesla's doing, or I like this, I like that. And I think based on what they've done with the Model Three and the Model S and other and their other products, they have a number written down somewhere that says, okay, this percentage of people won't recoup their money, like based on what we know already. So this money, you know, let's say five million, we're going to set this five million of the fifteen million off to the side and say we can use this money knowing that people aren't going to come back based on our history. I would actually like to ask them if, or or ask somebody who knows the law, if they are allowed to spend the money that they take in through pre-orders. Probably not. Probably not. But I think if you know you have $5 million sitting there, right, you can still spend... There's some there's some way they I'm sure they get around that. Yeah, but, cause, I mean, my thought would be you, you take in the money, but you would always have to have the capital on hand to pay it back. Right. If if every refund had to be processed at yeah. once, so the the benefit they get isn't like a twenty million dollar interest free loan because mm-hmm. they can't really spend that they can't spend that money unless they also have that money. Right. I think, but they they probably could keep the money and earn interest on it and they would you know so you're basically letting them earn interest on your your money mm-hmm. for free so but but that again i mean the interest on 20 million dollars isn't gonna you know fund the development of another car or anything right so um that's a great question i think we'll we'll try to get um get to tesla or get to a lawyer to ask how pre-orders work um and another and another thing i saw with the pre-orders was people placing three or four or five pre-orders at a time. Oh, really? Why were they doing that? Well, some people said it was an issue on the site where they didn't think they placed their pre-order. I had that issue. I placed mine and I didn't get a confirmation email Mm -hmm. until the next day. And I was like, I don't even know if it went through. I I see the charge on my credit card, but I have no confirmation. But it eventually came the next day. So some people went and did it more than once. And then (laughs) other people just did it just to be funny because they have money and they like Tesla. Like that's... So the number that he put out there, which was what two hundred thousand pre-orders, mm-hmm. three hundred thousand, something like that. I mean, how how true is that number? 
it's not it's not true at all. I've seen people say like, oh, 200,000 pre-orders represents X billion amount in sales. And it's like, dude, yeah. that will convert like 10 percent into sales, mm-hmm. you know, or some some percentage that's far lower than 100 percent. Let's say I don't know what it'll be exactly, but. Um, yeah, they're not going to, they're not going to sell 200,000 units on, you know, in the first month because everyone pre-ordered them. I do think it's a nice, you know, thing that they can brag about and, you know, just like, well, Ford, Ford hasn't really released a number of pre-orders for the Mach-E and I think they probably don't have any incentive to now that, you know, Tesla came out with their pre-order system. Uh, but yeah, pre-orders are just, you know, that's what you, you brag about when you introduce something, something new. Yeah. Um, I think Volkswagen bragged about their ID three pre-orders. I think it was 30, I'm looking at a number that says 33,000 right now. Um, at a thousand dollars a pop, 33,000 pre-orders for actual orders for the car is more than what Tesla did at a hundred dollars a pop for Cybertruck. I think there's a number out there that that says that Volkswagen did more in pre-orders on the ID3 than Tesla did, even though their numbers looked way higher. Oh, maybe they maybe they uh, were counting the value of the pre-orders. Right. If it were yeah, like a thousand. If the pre-orders were a thousand dollars and they had thirty thousand of them. Right. Not the not the more. number specifically, yeah. but the the dollar amount. Yeah. And yeah. and this is. I mean, I I think it's fair to say if someone called me a Tesla fanboy, I wouldn't get mad. I definitely <laughs> err more on that side. However, I'm I, I'm excited this week by the Mustang Mach-E. I'm excited about Cybertruck. I'm excited about this m- segment maturing and other companies coming in. And I said this to Chris last week on the podcast that the most exciting thing about Ford is that rather than just trying to make an electric car the way they make a car, which is what I think every other automaker has done so far. They kind of threw out the book and studied Tesla very closely. And they tried to take everything that they thought was worth taking from what Tesla did with the Model 3 and plans to do with the Model Y and apply that to the Mach-E. And I think in one sense, that's why the Mach-E is going to be really similar to the Model Y. But it's another reason I think the the Mach-E is going to be the the most successful um ev from a manufacturer we've seen to date i mean mm-hmm. i look at the sales numbers man all the evs that are out there the e-tron even even the leaf that's been around for a long time the 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 ipace i mean they're selling a handful of cars each yeah. in the hundreds or low thousands you know very very small numbers um and it's weird to balance the performance of those sales right now with what all of the automakers are saying they're going to do in three to five years, which is like convert their entire lineups to electrification, you know, to some major degree. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are you going to bridge the gap between very few people wanting your cars that your your EVs that you're making today and three to five years from now, when you're telling us you're going to have all these other EVs, like somebody has to crack the code in in terms of making an EV that people want to buy, I think the Mach E is going to do that. I, I actually think the um, Volkswagen ID will do that too. They're not going to mm-hmm. sell the ID in the U.S. as a hatchback. They're going to sell it as a as a crossover. But these are these are I think the first really good challenges to Tesla. Um, whereas I, I and I get criticized for this, but I don't think the I Pace, the E Tron. The Mercedes EQC. I don't. I don't think those are really solid uh, challenges to Tesla. I think they were first shots, first attempts. Uh, they will be learned from, and I think those German automakers will come out with uh, much better second generation cars. But I don't think they did enough with those first generation cars. I think part of the issue too is, and I. I I agree that e-tron and iPACE aren't great EVs in comparison to Tesla. Uh, I think they're still good cars, but I think part of the problem is the way these cars are marketed, right? And I know that sounds like kind of silly just based on, you know, how every other car is marketed. Um, but Tesla does such a good job of just organic marketing and they build a fan base unlike any other manufacturer I've well, seen. 
to be clear, Tesla spends $0 exactly. on marketing. Exactly. They spend which nothing. Which is insane considering that automotive manufacturers are the number one buyers of advertising. Mm -hmm. And you've got Tesla spending $0. That's right. insane. They do such a good job of just creating this culture around their cars, whether you like it or hate it, whichever side you're on. They do such a good job of that that no other manufacturer has done. And I, to your point, I think Ford is doing a good job of embracing that a little bit with the Mustang name and sort of promoting it more than than other manufacturers would their EVs. So, yeah, I think the Mach-E is going to do well. Um, but, yeah, on the, on the Cybertruck especially, I mean, look. It's ugly. Like I, I, I okay, know. So I'm glad you brought that up. Let's, I know there are strong the opinions on this, but for as ugly as it is to me personally, people still went crazy over this thing, and that's part of just that culture, I guess. So, I'm, I, like I said, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's mm -hmm. talk about the design. I I have written down that um, I have written down three questions, and I'm interested in what your answers are to each question. So, one, is it a beautiful design? I would answer no. Would you, you'd answer no as well? I would agree, yeah. All right. Is it an interesting design? I would answer yes. I would also answer yes. All right. Is it a cool design? I would answer yes. Uh, I don't... Because I cool. think there's a distinction between beautiful and cool. I agree with that. I, it's definitely not beautiful. And I think, you're, look, you're, you're perfectly, like, something being cool is still subjective. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's not going to be a universal thing for everybody. But um, a friend of our, a friend of the site um, recently posted on Facebook that he thought it was ugly. And he showed it to his 12-year-old. And his 12-year-old thought it was the coolest thing ever. He thought it looked like a Lamborghini. Well, yeah, because that's what 12-year-olds draw. They draw things that look like that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. But, I mean, it's it, it's... Like, I don't, I, I can't call it beautiful. I wouldn't call it beautiful. I wouldn't probably choose that form myself if I were going to draw a car right now. Uh, but I also wouldn't let it stop me from buying it because I think it's, uh, I, I think the specs are so incredible if they, if they manage to realize them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting and cool otherwise, um, that 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 would be more than enough for me and i don't i don't really care if i'm driving around in something that other people think is ugly like i would like it, it's come full circle on the pontiac aztec and it's cool again i would mm -hmm. totally drive a pontiac aztec <laughs> now because same you know yeah it, it's kind of like that so um you there, know to me there are certain car certain cars that are cool because they're ugly and the aztec is one of those cars the acura zdx is kind of one of those cars uh, this one, I don't know. It doesn't do it for me like that. I think it's just ugly and bad. It's interesting and it's different. Like, I give Tesla so much credit for trying new things like this and trying to be interesting and be different, but it doesn't always work, right? I don't think this yeah. works compared you know, to what else you see, especially they, from Rivian. They Well, the Rivian truck, it, it's so interesting to put the Rivian truck next to the Cybertruck because the, I agree, the Rivian truck, I think is a beautiful looking looks truck. great yeah it is also a truck design in the same vein as all the other truck designs that are out there mm -hmm. you know it's the same basic shape as an f-150 a ram and a silverado but it's a gorgeous interpretation of it right right um the the cyber truck just I, I i don't know why tesla went this way like Elon said, you know, the the shape is so angular because we couldn't stamp the the metal because the metal is so hard. And it, it begs the question, why does the metal have to be that hard? Like it what what's doesn't. the point of that? Because yeah. then it brings up a bunch of like I have questions about when you run this through a crash test. Like is it just going to bounce off the wall or, you know, Well, it, yeah, well think about I mean, once they start producing them, think about if a customer gets in an accident and how hard that's going to be able to fit how how hard that's going to be to fix well it's well yeah yeah you're right because and i think another really innovative thing about it is the frame of the truck is actually what you see on the outside so the, the there are no body panels per se like the fender you see the a pillar you see the rear fender those are all the structural elements of the car. Mm -hmm. So when you get into an accident, you're basically bending the frame right. when you yeah. when you get hit. But I worry about like, you know, modern cars are made to crumple. They're made to give. Mm -hmm. And if this is so hard that it doesn't crumple, that transfers the energy of a crash 
into both the occupants inside the vehicle and yeah. you know whatever you're hitting yeah so huge questions there around crash safety like i don't know I, I don't know how they're going to get around that. Um, yeah. So, so it just begs the question of why did they make it that hard if, if, if it was going to bring up all these other problems and questions. And that's another thing. We, we look at this and, and it just, I don't, there are so many things a production vehicle has that this doesn't have, like side view mirrors, like mm-hmm. windshield wipers, like a center mounted high stop lamp, you know, bigger headlights. And like, we, we are trying to do the research right now to find out what the laws are from the federal government for what vehicles have to have. And we're trying to see, you know, what the Cybertruck will have to adopt in order to be legal. Um, or I've even speculated that they might classify it as a heavy duty truck and it might not be subject to the same federal regulations as a light duty truck or a passenger car. Well, so, so even heavy duty trucks, uh, if we're talking just about basic, basic safety equipment, everybody, every car needs side mirrors until they implement the, you know, the the ca- side cameras, which probably won't be for a few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, every car needs wipers. Um, I believe there's some laws that, I, I mean, I know there are laws specific to headlights, but I don't know how the, the Cybertruck would would uh get i don't around know them. right it would yeah. get around that just the, the lights don't look like their production and the tail lights don't look like their production either because they don't have you know we typical did report turn signals on, or anything we did report on a patent a couple months ago of a really weird um windshield wiper design by tesla and to be clear there is l- literally no windshield wiper on the cyber truck but mm-hmm. I, it suggests to me that for all of these issues we're talking about tesla is working on some innovative solution that just doesn't we just haven't thought of it because auto manufacturers haven't done it before so you know i i just you clearly can't you 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 almost can't say that because you don't see it that they're not going to figure it out because they just don't follow the same rules as the other automakers They, they don't accept like oh i gotta stick a side mirror on it it's like they just sit around figuring out how can we do a side mirror without a side mirror and still have it be legal. And somehow they're going to come up with an answer and it's going to be weird and innovative and it's either going to work great or fail spectacularly. You know? Well, so I will say this too about side mirrors. Uh, hopefully the camera equipment, the, the camera technology catches up and they make that a law at some point because side mirrors are definitely an outdated you know yeah piece that would of be good for all cars right um but there's a study that i saw that i'm looking at right now that says side mirrors can add up to 10 percent of additional uh an extra 10 percent of drag to a vehicle depending on how big they are so assuming tesla says okay 500 miles of range what happens if you put just big chunky which they Definitely won't. They will put the most streamlined, sleek side mirrors on there. But what if there were bit these big, chunky side mirrors on there and they couldn't achieve their range because of that? Or the, the windshield wipers were just affecting range so much? Because so, if you're putting money down on this car expecting it to be what they promise, but yeah. then when the production model comes around and it has these things that might affect the performance of it, would you be disappointed or...? I mean, I, you're exactly right that the range of an EV is much more affected by things like drag than the range of a gas car. Um, even on like the Tesla Model 3 that I drive, the aero covers on the, the wheels, mm-hmm. if you take them off, which you can easily, they just pop right off, right. it might look better, but it, it, it actually reduces your range by like 5%. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if 5% is right, but it reduces your range an appreciable amount. Um, and yeah, if you start sticking things on the Cybertruck's design, um, and then you know go out and test the range, you you would probably get less. We were we were just given so little information. Like you said, 500 miles is is. I guess we're assuming that's 500 miles with this design, with no drag from any of those items you're talking about. I I don't know. I don't. He yeah. might mean no matter what, we're going to hit 500 miles somehow. Yeah. Um, I mean, but that's towing the line a little bit, right? Because if you say here, 500 miles, it'll cost this much. Give us money. Give us a deposit now, and you'll get this truck. But then you order the truck, and it's not the truck you thought you were going to get. Let's be clear, though, that like when they take the deposits, it's not like they're taking the deposits to go build the truck. They right. may have done that in yeah. the past because they were so cash-strapped. 
But now, I mean, they collected like $20 million. That's mm-hmm. not going to that's not going to go very far in, in a vehicle development. And like I said, there might be laws that they can't even touch that money. Right. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, if I would be, I would be, I wouldn't be hugely disappointed if it went from 500 to 450, because I still think that's an astounding amount. Yeah. Of course. And in, in my opinion, for a normal passenger car, I think 300 miles is the sweet spot to completely erase range anxiety. Um, or to get it down to almost zero. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason I want a truck to go 400 or more is because I want to tow with it. So yeah. my dream is to go around the country towing a trailer with my wife, and I would love to do that in an EV. And if the EV has a range of 450 or 500 miles, that's obviously going to be hugely affected by whatever we tow. But it would be great if I could still get 300 miles of range while towing. You right. know, mm-hmm. that would be more than enough. And and so. You know, my only disappointment is when the range falls, the range with a trailer falls. And like I said, it will anyway, because, you know, when you're towing a trailer, well, you see, I don't even know the answer to that. I was going to say you're going to have to have really big side mirrors to see around the trailer that you would stick on the Cybertruck. But if they find a solution with cameras or, or some other way, you know, they may find a way to, you know, stick a camera on the trailer too, and and you get your your side view that way. I don't know. Yeah, a lot of a lot of modern trucks already, like the GMCs and the Fords, have have camera mirror or uh, trailer yeah, cameras and and trailer sensors and trailer so that, sensors yeah. and all kinds of advanced stuff. I don't think that'll be a huge issue. Just, but yeah, to your point, towing is going to be a, a a big a big reduction in you know overall range and. And that's it's fine. But that's I mean, why you, you just have to count all this. You just have to account for all this truck stuff, and it's hard. I, I'll tell just, you. I'll tell you what actually makes me most excited. If if I were to ever own a Cybertruck, or or that makes me want to own one. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite vehicles I've driven in the last year, or even the last few years, is the Ford Raptor. Uh, that truck is just so fun. It is, but it's not fun in like a sports car way because it's not a sports car. It's, you know, lifted off the ground. It's got tons of suspension travel. It just feels like you can go anywhere. It's fast as hell. And, and it's such a different driving experience. I love it. However, I've, I've kind of drunk the EV (laughs) Kool-Aid, um, and, and whether it's Tesla or not, um, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go back and buy a gas powered vehicle anytime soon. So, you know, I wouldn't ever, I don't ever envision myself buying a Raptor. This to me looks like the fun of a Raptor without the guilt of gas, you know, the performance on it. I mean, we, we know how even their you know, the Model 3, which isn't necessarily a performance car, how fast it can go, mm-hmm. you know, to see this 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds, lifted high off the ground, it looks like it can go anywhere, you know, air suspension that can lift it higher. I mean, it kind of looks to me like a, a, a more guilt-free Ford Raptor experience, which I, uh, I like that aspect to it as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I think you're giving the, the Cybertruck a lot of credit because the Raptor is... I mean, just the engineering that goes into that damn thing to make that truck feel as good as it does is a testament to, you know, Ford's decades of of racing experience, right? And Ford, you know, I tend to be tough on them a lot, um, but the Raptor is one of my favorite vehicles, and and I think it's fantastic. So the Tesla truck, I think, has potential to be Raptor-esque, but um, it's just, it doesn't... I can't imagine that it will be as good to drive as a Raptor or even like close It might not, to but look, I capable. never I never took the Raptor and jumped it off of things. Right. You know, I drove it around town and had fun, you know, blasting it on the highway and things yeah. like that. Uh, so I'm probably, you know, my envelope of, of fun driving in the Raptor, you know, didn't include probably the stuff uh, that it could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would also freely admit that I think in all of Tesla's vehicles, they make them extremely powerful. They make them extremely fast in a straight line. But beyond that, I don't think to date they've put tons of development resources into making them all around performance vehicles. Right. Yeah, that's sort of my point. We we saw that with the the Porsche Taycan coming out, and you mm-hmm. could definitely saw Elon get very defensive and insecure about someone suggesting that they're the Model S was slow. Right. So, you know, he sent over all his engineers to the Nürburgring and cooked up a new special edition of the Model S to outgun the, the Taycan. And, and so 
if if anything, I hope Tesla learned from that experience that there is more to performance than power and straight line speed. Right. Um, who knows? I'd like to see this Cybertruck. You know, you know, have them race it in the in the Baja 1000 or yeah, something, and let's see what great. it can do. Um, that's really the hard part about mm-hmm. all of this is that it's you know it's two years away. Um, all of these EVs are so like they announce them and they get us excited and and interested and they're so far away. I wish these were more like uh, Apple keynotes where Steve Jobs used to say, "Here's the iPhone and you can order it today and we're delivering it in a month." You know? Yeah, I want, I I think, want this like on my doorstep. I think more car debuts should be like that. I mean, not just Tesla. Every manufacturer <sighs> is releasing great. cars like earlier and earlier, and you have to just wait. And I don't understand why. But yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know why either. I, it, it annoys me more than anything. As mm-hmm. excited as I am to, to see the new vehicles and to learn about what's coming, I don't want to wait two years. Right. Um, that, that annoys me. Um, so one, um, so we've talked about the design. Let's talk about the debut itself because it was part train wreck, but <laughs> part, I mean, spectacle you couldn't turn away from. It's all anybody can talk about. Um, a couple of things that happened. Um, they wanted to, Elon wanted to show the strength of the um, stainless steel skin. So they had like what I think was a Ford F-150 door and they hit it with a sledgehammer and obviously dented it. And then they took a sledgehammer to the door of the Cybertruck and didn't dent it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, then, however, <laughs> they wanted to do a similar test to show off the strength of the the, the glass. So... Uh, they dropped a big metal ball on a sheet of the glass that was outside the truck and it, it survived unscathed. Then they took that same metal ball over to the actual pickup truck on stage, tossed it at the, at the side window and the side window completely broke. It didn't shatter. So I don't know, maybe it gets points for that. Uh, but it definitely spider webbed and broke. Mm -hmm. Um, then they thought, well, let's try it on the back door. And that'll work. And it didn't. It did the exact same thing. And they broke the back window, too. And what was hilarious about it was Elon had to finish the entire presentation with these two broken windows behind him. Um, And he shrugged it off. I mean, he is the P.T. Barnum of our age. I mean, anything anything that seemingly gets attention is good to him, whether it's good or bad. It's people talking about it. Um, So I think in, in, in that sense, it was a huge success from from Elon's perspective, because it it was the, it it was and still is the talk of the town uh, coming up on on a week later. Um, how did I, it come off to you, though? I have a conspiracy theory. OK, I think he did this all on purpose. I think this was all big part of his marketing scheme to get people talking about it, positive or negative. People are talking even the about broken it. windows, even the broken windows. Wow. Yeah, I mean that's that's like a, a serious level of cynicism that <laughs> impresses me. Um, I see. My thing was that I wasn't really offended by that either. Like, I I don't expect a prototype vehicle will be able to stand up to what a production vehicle theoretically should, right? So if you have this prototype on stage and you're throwing metal balls at it and you're hitting it with a hammer, if it breaks, okay, whatever, it breaks, like it happens. I I'm totally fine with that. Um, but I, in, in my crazy, you know, conspiracy theory mind, I think that was part of the plan. I think they were going to make the glass crack or at least hope it cracked and, and everybody would be talking about it and it'd be a big funny joke. And then he can go tweet out the actual video of, of them throwing the ball at it, uh, later on his Twitter. Which he did. Which and he the, did. yeah, he showed the version of it. I think, I think they taped it earlier in the day when they mm-hmm. were kind of practicing and it didn't shatter. Um, his explanation for why it shattered was that the sledgehammer uh, hit on the same door, cracked the, the base of the glass. And right. Then but then the when people it. asked about the rear window, he didn't have it. Right. An yeah. That doesn't make sense <laughs> at all why that wouldn't affect uh, yeah. the rear window. So um, uh, it was, I mean, audible gasps when that thing rolled out on stage Mm -hmm. i mean even i I think even the tesla fanboys were like am i is this a i think everyone asked if it was a joke yeah like that's how how shocking it was um but think about this i mean is there any other auto manufacturer that does debuts like this that has an audience like this i mean this is apple-esque just promoting their product and Absolutely. i think he does i think that's the best analog is 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 and it's not apple today it's mm-hmm. it's steve jobs yeah. era apple yeah it's it's this fervent fan base 
that that hangs on his every word, that is excited about every product. Um, and it has created a new Mac versus PC dynamic in automotive. Um, I was telling somebody today, you know, um, I used to work at um, Autoblog and Autoblog's sister site was Engadget, which is a really big consumer gadget uh, website. And we would, and this was back in the 2000s, we would stare with envy at every, at, at Engadget during every Apple keynote with Steve Jobs unveiling a new iPhone or whatever, because their traffic would shoot through the roof. And I'm like, man, we don't have anything like that in automotive. Yeah. And now we do. Like automotive has a Steve Jobs figure where he, and, and I, I, I also tried to explain this to you guys when we were talking about it in our editorial meeting the other day. Elon Musk and Tesla, they manufacture news. Like they make they have they have made every turn of their neck, every word out of their mouth, anything they do into this newsworthy thing that I don't think the other automakers know what to do. I mean, there you you can't ask Mary Barra or any other automotive CEO to suddenly do what Elon's doing. I mean, no, that's that's not the kind of CEO they are. And and I don't know that you can find a CEO like that. They're not growing on trees. Right. I think you I think. They're out there. I think the automotive industry is going to shift soon, and I think we're going to see more of these type of CEOs. Um, but, I mean, yeah, to the early analogy, I mean, Elon Musk is the Steve Jobs of Apple, the, of Tesla that Steve Jobs was to Apple. You know, it's just there's there's no other manufacturer that puts on a show like this, for better or worse. You know, you can you can sit here and criticize them all you want, but, I mean, how many people watch that damn debut oh, so even many. even people outside of the auto industry yeah. were just tuned into this this truck and of course everybody was tweeting about it so yeah. i mean you everyone can't you really my, everyone can't in my life ha yeah. has commented to me on it um and you know i funny that we bring up apple uh, you could also call me an apple fanboy i have owned apples all my life and and i was definitely on that side of the fence during the mac versus pc era and it was the same thing in that you know, PC people would be screaming about how, you know, the Apple products are stupid. They don't have, you know, they took out the CD-ROM drive. They took out this. That's stupid. Why would you ever do that? It's an inferior product. And Apple just kept going because it felt like they were just going to act like they were going to write their own rules. Mm -hmm. And they got enough people to follow them. And then those became the rules. Yep. And, and so it just feels like we're marching down that path with Tesla it's it's naturally divisive, but I think that plays right into um, Elon and Tesla's plan yep. because everybody has an opinion. Mm -hmm. And if everybody has an opinion and half of the people have a positive opinion and, on, on, and are on your side, that's a lot of people. Yep. The worst thing is nobody having an opinion <laughs> because yeah. then you're just dead in the water. And I think that's where the I-PACE, the e-tron, the, the EQC, right. I think that's the problem they have is nobody even knows they exist. Mm -hmm. Nobody has an opinion on those cars. Yeah. Even right. if they are good cars, you know, they 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 don't move the needle on being good EVs. And, yeah. and that's where I think they, they falter. Yeah, I agree with that. I will also say this, uh, Brandon... Turkis, our managing editor, was at the debut of, of Cybertruck. And what a lot of people didn't see uh, outside of, you know, the antics on stage were the many people dressed up like Blade Runner and it was crazy so costumes. It was so weird. I will never hang out with any of those people. Like, just, <laughs> I can't imagine going to that event and just being surrounded by a bunch of crazy people like that. It was the weirdest so event strange. I've ever seen. Today. Yeah. A lot of. <laughs> A high degree of pageantry, let's say. Right. Um, I also, before we move on, I also want to bring up this this thing that has happened since the Cybertruck debuted, which is this tug of war controversy. So during the debut, Elon showed a video of a tug of war between a Cybertruck and a Ford F one fifty, and said that the Cybertruck won, and you could see the Cybertruck like dragging the F one fifty while its tires spun. And Elon said it was going uphill, although that's in dispute because it kind of looks like the going uphill part was a camera trick, but nevertheless. Um, 
So, and look, that's that's a marketing stunt. It's the exact same thing Ford did when they had an F-150 tow a, yep. you know, a train exactly. along a track. It doesn't show ne- anything. Neither of them actually matter in the larger sense. No, it demonstrates that physics works. Right. And that's all. I mean, that's not a huge surprise. Yeah. However, um, you know, because it stirs so much emotion in people, a Ford employee, and I don't even, I don't even know if we looked up what level he is or where he's at or he's a he's a high level executive i don't remember his exact position but he's up there okay but on his own this ford executive basically tweeted to to elon that that he wanted or ford wanted a rematch um if they would bring the cybertruck um and to be clear that was him acting on his own that was not sanctioned by ford officially right um however I mean, once it was out there, it's the internet, and Elon responded to him, responded to him before you know Ford as a company could walk it back or whatever. And basically, I mean, Elon said, "quote Bring it on," and and then said, "We'll try to make it happen next week." Um, and now there's this all this talk about you know um, you know what does it matter who's going to win whatever. And and basically, it sounds like. Um, the 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 test is going to win probably either way because of weight it just weighs so much more it probably weighs six to six and a half thousand pounds Mm -hmm. and there's no f-150 that can kind of match that weight now if you loaded the weight up of the f-150 i don't know i don't know how they're going to do it but man i i feel like every automaker should learn a lesson from porsche and if you if you step to tesla Elon's going to step back right. and he's going to make a huge thing of it and he's not going to rest until he wins. And it's so it's like there's nothing for you to gain by poking that bear. Yeah. And to your earlier point about Elon being like the ultimate marketer, it's weird to me that Ford wanted to like step back from it. Like just embrace it. Who cares? You have the best selling vehicle. I agree. Ever. Completely. Like, they should have they should have leaned into just it. Just let this guy, whoever his name is, because. Obviously, Ford has you know very little personality on the on the high end exec side. I don't even know his name, but just let this guy like fight it out with Elon on Twitter, and then do a thing. Like, who cares? None of this matters in the larger sense. Just do it, Ford. You know? Yeah, just find a way to make it fun and light, and right. not like contentious, and 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 lean into it. And like I said, it's I, I think the traditional conservative automaker reaction is to no 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 you know step back. Let's right. you know. Not, let's not do that at all. Yeah. And and th- but this isn't the kind of company that Tesla is, or the kind of world that they're creating in the automotive industry. It's so it would have been much more interesting if Ford had leaned into it and tried to make it fun and lighthearted. And um, there there was more controversy between Ford and Tesla actually because the Mach E unveiling event occurred on the same like uh, <laughs> property or base yes. as the as the Tesla where like where you, you were there it was, was it was in there? Hawthorne California mm-hmm. where Tesla has SpaceX um and we we'll talk about this more but I rode in the in the Mach E for a little bit and we drove past the SpaceX rocket like wow, they're so just right next door so we're right there like right. there's no and of course there's no subtlety purpose. yeah of course Right. And I guess I, you know, we heard uh, unofficially that that did not please Elon. However, uh, Elon did send a tweet congratulating Ford on the Mach E and Ford responded. So, you know, in public, they kept it nice. And, and Elon right. has always put forth the message that it's good when other automakers make good EVs. And that was why he started Tesla was to, you know, make everybody make uh, be- make more and better EVs. Someone asked a, a Ford PR person on this Mach-E event, um, oh, you, you know, you guys are doing it right next to Tesla or SpaceX, right? You guys are doing that on purpose. And the, the PR person kind of like, you know, grinned a little bit. He's like, no, we've debuted cars here before. Like we've, we've used this property a bunch of times. Like this isn't why we're using it, but... I mean, you know yeah, maybe that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, but, but you know they're But they just, know. Yeah, yeah, they know. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if the tug of war happens next week. Yeah. Um, we will certainly cover it. Um, all right. Well, let's let's move on. Um, I wanted to circle back to the Mustang Mach-E because that's what the last uh, podcast episode was all about. And we got um, some really interesting comments um, from listeners of the show. So let's go through a few of them. I'll read the first one. 
Um, this is from um, a regular commenter uh, whose name is Blah, which is a name I love. Right. Um, he says, uh, cars have gotten too expensive. Also, I don't recognize the EcoBoost Mustang as a true Mustang. It needs a V8. Mm. And then he compliments uh, Chris Smith from the podcast last week. Great job on defending the Mustang crowd. Very well done. Uh, to be clear, he uh, our conversation last week was about whether the, the Mach-E should have the Mustang name. Um, and everybody comes down on one side or the other. Uh, this guy uh, did not come down on my side. So I lost <laughs> I lost the debate, according to this guy. Um, what did you think about it, though? I mean, do you, uh, you know, Mustang enthusiasts, diehard ones don't like the Mustang name being used this way. Does it bother you at all? Um. I don't know if it bothers me because I'm not a Mustang guy. I I, under, I can understand where Mustang guys are, you know, offended by it. But I also think the EcoBoost Mustang is the best Mustang. Sorry, this commenter. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's just an easy way to draw people in, an easy way to let's say, you know, okay, maybe you don't own a Mustang, but you know the Mustang name, right? And you want a Mustang, quote unquote. So just buy this SUV that's also a Mustang and you can fit your kids in it and your wife and your family. Like it's not for the traditional Mustang buyer, but I understand why they use the name. Actually, that that leads us into the next commenter. Why don't you uh, go ahead and read that one? Who's it from? Yeah, so Christopher Manley says, I 100% understand the emotional argument against the decision, but I think going with the Mustang name was genius. Ford is not sexy at all. Mustang is and EVs have to be sexy. For the first time ever, I have seen Tesla fans praise, lust, and even order a Ford product, and I think this is the biggest win of them all. The age of late 20s and early 30s are lusting over this thing. From my group chats on Facebook. And what do they call it? Mustang, not Ford. It hurts, but that's change. This will have zero impact on Mustang sales, but I bet my money in five years the two-door Mustang will be in the garage and the Mach-E daily driven, a la Cayenne and 911. Yeah, I, I made that argument to, to Chris that I thought this was very analogous to Porsche uh, expanding the Porsche name to include SUVs and, and four-doors. Um, like the uh, Panamera, uh, he disagreed though because he said, and I don't buy this at all. He said Porsche was a brand name, but Mustang was a model name, mm -hmm. and so it's totally different. And I'm like, it's not totally different. It's you know, before the the Cayenne and Panamera, Porsches were only sports cars, and right. then it freaked everybody out when they brought along an SUV and something that wasn't a sports car. But now. Porsche has two cars in every garage instead of one. You know, it's it it only helps. Yeah. Um, so the, that leads into the last comment. Um, this is from JBSC6. Fun podcast. Imagine you will imagine if you will a sports car owner has a better half who needs a four door, and instead of buying a Porsche Macan or Alpha Stelvio, they can purchase a Mustang Mach E. It's a win win for everyone with a Mustang GT500 and a Mustang Mach E in the same two car garage. You guys who are single don't live with this concept of having family travel requirements while still wanting fun. And I agree with that 100. Yeah. percent I see this as a companion. Uh, excellent companion to the Mustang. If Mustang people don't buy this thing out of spite, I think they're all the worse off for it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree with that. So yeah, we, we appreciate your feedback on that. And we got a, got a ton of feedback on Facebook and elsewhere on the site. Um, of course you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at motor one com where this discussion about the Mach-E and of course our discussion about the Tesla Cybertruck continues and also on our website, motor1.com, where you can leave comments on all the articles uh, we're writing. I have engaged with the comments more this past week with Mach-E and the LA Auto Show and the Cybertruck than I ever have before. It's been an, an amazing week of debuts. All right, so coming up, we're going to find out what we've been driving this week. Uh, before the break, though, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So hit the subscribe button so you never miss a show. Welcome back. Now it's time for our favorite segment of the show, what we're driving this week. Jeff, you had a particularly interesting week of driving while attending the LA Auto Show, so tell us what you drove. Yeah, so I spent eight wonderful days in Los Angeles for the Auto Show. Wow, that's um, a lot of days to it be is. subjected to Los Angeles. <laughs> it is. Um, and I, the, well, the thing I actually drove is a Hyundai prototype that I cannot talk about yet. So that actually goes up uh, next week, December 2nd, will be my full review on that. Uh, but I did spend some brief time in the Mach-E 
prototype uh, at the debut event. So we got a little ride along that was like I don't know five five or seven minutes maybe in the in the Mach E prototype. Uh, we did some zero to sixty runs, some cones, some street drives. Um, so you, I mean, not only did you see it in person, not only did you sit in it and you know touch the buttons, mm-hmm. you rode in it. Yep. So my biggest question is. A, does it feel like a Mustang? And if not, does it at least feel good to drive or at least ride in? It does not feel like a Mustang, um, but it feels like a better I-Pace just sitting oh, in it. Okay. So I think the interior, is, I mean, the interior is nothing like any Mustang. Like this is so far from a Mustang that it's hard to even fathom that they share the same name, at least inside, right? When you look at the interior, right. it's got that massive 15 inch screen. It's got all this fancy tech, this nice material, which one thing I really don't understand is why companies feel like they need to use just tons of leather everywhere. Ford did a really good job of implementing like, you know, the Amazon Alexa cloth like material on the, mm-hmm. on the door panels and on the dash. Um, and it's totally animal free. The cabin, they use a fake leather. That's really, really good. Um, the cabin, I mean, I was just blown away by how nice it is, really, for, for a, a Ford, especially. Yeah, yeah. It looks like it was made by a completely different automaker mm-hmm. than Ford, which is both a compliment and a criticism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the so the actual drive component of it, uh, we obviously didn't get to drive, but we rode in, in the passenger seat. And uh, it feels quick. I mean, there's nothing... It didn't blow me away. Now, you weren't in the GT500 version. No, we weren't weren't in the GT version. We were in the uh, premium prototype. Okay, so that's still the the pretty high power one. Yeah. Probably the 300 mile version. Yeah, it was the dual motor um, 300 mile version. Or Sorry, all wheel drive 300 300 mile version. So it was quick. I mean, it was quick enough. It didn't feel like, you know, crazy fast or anything. I think that our driver hit it a few times. just down a straight and it it felt good there's just i don't know i mean it's hard to really tell how how the car performs without driving it yeah um so it's only just a small sample but we have we have been told we'll we'll be invited to the first drive that ford hosts um so we'll be among the first to get to drive it and you know i i don't think the bar is to have it handle exactly like a Mustang. I mean, I don't even know what that would be like with a vehicle like this. Um, But I think good handling or great handling for what it is, is a reasonable bar to expect. So yeah, um, that seems within, within reach for them. So we um, did do a little cone course, like an autocrossy type cone course, and mm -hmm. it felt fine. It felt flat enough. I mean, the tires were squealing a little bit, but nothing, it didn't feel like it, it was just totally against doing that. So I think it'll, it'll be decent performer well and it i mean it should benefit from what all evs benefit from which is a very very low center of gravity with a high high weight down there so that 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 lends some uh, gives it i think a you know a head start on good handling but there's Mm -hmm. still a lot that goes into it obviously right um so yeah i'm i'm jealous i i I did not i did not expect to have the reaction to the maki that i had uh as positive a reaction as i had so i'm really eager to see it in person um and try it out um hopefully we can um report on what it's like to drive soon and i especially want to match it up against some other evs um and see how it performs like the e-tron um and things like that so yeah super jealous um all right so last week i um as i um told everyone on the podcast i've i've kind of stopped uh receiving media vehicles to review so i've kind of been stuck with the same car to drive for a while now um for a few weeks and it's the the tesla model 3 that um i have and that i'm now driving you know as my regular car every day and the reason i the only reason i bring it up again is because i got to take it on my first road trip and I thought uh, it'd be interesting to share. So uh, we drove from Cleveland to Pittsburgh to visit um, our in-laws, uh, my, my brother-in-law and his family. And that's about a two and a half hour trip. Um, so, you know, we, we had to charge the Model 3 up to 100%, which, you know, you don't normally do unless you're doing a long trip. So we had a little over 300 miles when we left. Um, we, uh, got there, it had, you know, plenty of miles left, like 100 and 
20 or 30. We drove around for the weekend. We did plug it in at uh, my brother-in-law's house over just a regular 110 outlet uh, for an afternoon. Uh, but what I was excited about was um, our plan was to leave and then stop at a supercharger on the way back that was right outside of Pittsburgh. And I've never been to a supercharger, so I was pretty excited about this. So we, we pull up and the supercharger is in a Sheets gas station and it's just off to the side. There's there's eight uh, chargers um, there and there's a, a Model S already there at the very far end. And knowing uh, my charger etiquette, I make sure to not park next to him because if you share a charger with somebody, it cuts the speed in half, on, at least on the old uh, superchargers. So I park farther down and plug my car in. And what was cool was we, we didn't need to charge it fully because we just needed you know enough to get back home. So since there's Netflix and Hulu uh, that you get on the Model 3 now, um, we just pulled up an episode of Bless This Mess that we've been watching on Hulu and watched that for 21 minutes. And we had about uh, 120 miles in, in 21 minutes, uh, which was more than enough to get home. Uh, and then we went into the sheets and, you know, got a drink and went to the bathroom, came back out and had another 20 miles. So it was a really it was just a I, I like I said, that's my first supercharger every Everybody with an EV, whether it's a Tesla or not, is going to experience, you know, fast charging on the road. And it was, I had to say, I I like the experience. I recognize and fully acknowledge that, yes, it's quicker to, you know, fill your tank with gas. Uh, what I liked about it, though, and I don't know if everyone will agree or think I'm just making excuses, but on a long trip, like... I get sleepy, I get distracted, and to like stop for more than two minutes can reset me a little bit. So it was a really nice experience to like stop watching watch a sitcom and get a drink and then start again. Like I felt like mm -hmm. okay, that woke me up and I'm ready to go the the rest of the distance. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, maybe that's me making excuses, but I thought the supercharged experience was super cool, and it charged way. F I mean, I didn't know what to expect, but it charged way faster than it does at home on our level two charger. This is a random question, but have you ever been to a supercharger with like a covering over it? I haven't, and this no. one ha did not have that. Okay, that was just I was just curious because I was thinking about getting a Model Three and just like how it would fare on road trips. Um, from Miami to Orlando or Miami mm -hmm. to Jacksonville or something. And I know when we do it now, we usually have to stop about halfway or three quarters of the way to get gas. And I mean, Florida, it's always raining at some point. Um, and so I don't know if you're thinking like you have to get out and plug the thing in and it's raining. That's not, I mean, that's not going to stop me from doing it, but just, I don't know. That was a random well, just, thought. Just like gas pumps have are covered, you know? Right. Exactly. I agree. Well, and, and every supercharger is different. Like they, mm -hmm. they just kind of make them to fit the space. So it could be that a lot of superchargers in Florida have covers, not just for rain, but for yeah. shade because it's so hot. Right. Um, and then that you would be said, a good idea though. You said there was a, you, it was in a parking lot of a grocery store or? No, a, sh uh, a sheets. So a parking lot of a gas station, ironically. Oh, a gas station. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we were parked right in front of, you know, 12 uh, gas pumps yeah um and so while while we were there two other cars came so there were four of us um filling up half the the charging stations uh, so it got busy while we were there mm -hmm. um but you know you can see on the tesla app when you're going to a supercharger how many are available and mm -hmm. how many uh, are taken um but yeah i really like it and this was my first time to use autopilot um extensively um so and i I've learned that a lot of people, myself included, don't understand the difference between autopilot and full self-driving on Teslas. Autopilot comes standard with every Tesla. Mm -hmm. And it what autopilot is, is like Cadillac Super Cruise. You, you set it and it's like a cruise control and it will hold the line in a, um, in a lane um, for forever around every turn down to zero up to whatever it will you know it'll it'll follow that and not not deviate and drive basically i don't want to say drive itself because you're not supposed to say that and you you know you have to keep a hand on the wheel or else it turns itself off um so that's autopilot that comes standard full self-driving adds a couple things right now and the future promise of more the things that adds right now are um 
the advanced summon, which is the thing that brings your car to you in the parking lot. That's kind of a novelty trick. Mm -hmm. What's cooler is uh, navigate by autopilot. And that's where you're doing autopilot, but it's, it's following the navigated route. So it'll actually change lanes and take an exit to another highway and and you know take you to your destination the only thing is right now it doesn't work off the highway it only works mm -hmm. on anyway all this is to say that you like i had autopilot on well now i had to navigate by autopilot on for like 90 percent of this trip and right before we were getting off the highway on the way home when the trip was over i said to my wife i don't mean to alarm you but <laughs> i have steered the car about a total of 10 minutes today yeah. <laughs> like i have like i've had my hand on the wheel i've been paying attention but i have let this thing do most of the work the yeah. entire ride home and it really is an interesting way to do a, a long trip because it does take a lot of the effort off of your shoulders i mm -hmm. feel i felt a lot less exhausted after yeah. the drive home i agree with that and i also think it's if the tesla if the model 3 is great at two things it's definitely road trips and it's definitely sitting in traffic because that autopilot in traffic here in Miami was like a lifesaver because yeah, yeah, traffic just, is miserable on the way home and it just goes and does it on its own. You barely have to do anything. And that's that's a huge selling point to me. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was, you know, I have a lot more ventures ahead of me. Maybe I'll report on some of those as well. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Jeff, what's your Twitter handle? I always forget to ask before. It is not a boat captain. That's right. We have the most interesting <laughs> Twitter handles among us. Um, you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff, which is the least interesting Twitter handle. Um, Jeff, thanks for being on the show with me. Yeah. Thanks, John. And of course, thank you all out there for listening. We'll see you next week.